All right, here we are again for the final part in this little series where I remake my high school sewing project. In the previous two parts, I looked at just how bad the sewing was on the original version of this ensemble, which to my surprise wasn't that bad. And in the second part, I remade the blouse. So if you'd like to watch those videos before you carry on with this one, I will put links to them below and above in the cards. Whereas for the blouse, I used stash fabric. For the skirt, I did have to buy some fabric that was suitable. I chose this. X Designer Silk Viscose Blend from Rainbow Fabrics Kilburn. They have lots of dead stock fabrics, particularly this year with so many cancelled fast fashion orders. They've got lots of lovely printed dress viscoses. So if that's something you're interested in, I do recommend them. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them. I just like to try and support businesses that are making an effort to be more sustainable. Now, this fabric is lovely and silky, which means it's going to be a nightmare to cut. I also have the dilemma of trying to match the stripes on a circle, so it's going to take some figuring out. But sometimes it's best to just not overthink things, so um, let's get cracking. Now I realised as I was editing this video that I never actually showed you how to draft a circle skirt pattern. There are seemingly endless tutorials for how to do this online and I can highly recommend those on YouTube made by Annika Victoria and The Closet Historian. But here's how I did it for this skirt. So firstly we're going to have to do some maths. Start by taking your waist measurement and add however much seam allowance you want to use. For my skirt I was going for 2.5 centimeters of seam allowance on each side of my seam, so 5 centimeters total. We are then going to divide that number by 6.28, or 2 pi if you're into geometry, and that is going to give us the radius of our circle. Don't be put off by the word radius, it's just the name for the distance from the very center of the circle to the outer edge. So in my case, my waist measurement was 70 centimeters plus two lots of 2.5 centimeters for the seam allowance equals 75 centimeters. I then divide that by 6.28. No matter what your waist measurement or seam allowance is, you always divide by 6.28. That part always stays the same. So 75 centimeters divided by 6.28 equals 11.942675. Yeah, you know what, let's, let's just call it 12, 12 centimeters. <laughs> When in doubt, round up. Then to make the pattern piece, we are going to start with a square of paper. Make it pretty big, at least as long and wide as you want your skirt to be, plus the radius measurement we just worked out. Then measure down from the top right hand corner that radius measurement we calculated earlier. For me, this was 12 centimeters. Then we are going to draw a curve by measuring 12 centimeters away from that top corner around in a circular motion like this. This is the waist of the skirt. Then we need to draw a second curve for the hem. To draw this line, we need to measure down from the top right hand corner again, our original radius, so 12 centimeters for me, and then add however long you want your skirt to be. For me, that's 60 centimeters, so a total of 72 centimeters. Then we are going to draw our curve again by measuring 72 centimeters down from the top right hand corner in a circular motion like this. When we're done, you should have a pattern piece that looks something like this. Cut it out and we can begin cutting the fabric. Well, first of all, I actually made my skirt too long and had to cut five centimeters off the hem. I did this by just measuring up five centimeters along the curve of the hem and then chopping it off along that line. With this striped fabric, I spent a long time carefully matching up all the stripes. This was made doubly tricky as to cut a circle skirt like this, you have to fold the fabric in half once lengthways and once widthways so that you have four layers of fabric. I played around with the placement of the selvages and the direction of the stripes a lot until I was happy. As I only added seam allowance to the side seams of the skirt, I had to mark on the seam allowance at the waist and the hem. That was one of the most difficult things I've cut in a very, very long time. Oh boy, it is nowhere near perfect, um, but it's okay. Um, it's pinned together, right sides together at the moment. But what I was able to do with the cutting was, oh, oh that's great. <laughs> Just knocked over my pins. What I was able to do, which I'm quite pleased with, is get this wide orange stripe down the center. So that's gonna be running uh, vertically to the ground and then um, the peachier stripes should match up 
on the diagonal. You can see uh, I ended up chalking it on my cutting lines and then cutting it differently. So I'm going to have to go in and sponge off those chalk marks. But yeah, that was uh, kind of stressful. So I'm glad it's done. Sometimes there's nothing for it but to just jump in the deep end and give it a go. And that's what I did. And I think it's going to be all right. Still got to cut the waistband. And I was hoping to do bias binding for the hem, uh, but I'm not sure I'll have enough of this fabric left to actually make enough bias. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe. Maybe it'll have to be a very skinny <laughs> bias binding. It's done. So I've got some thread. I've got some stash thread, which should be quite good for this. Um, I think it's polyester. Yeah, it's very old though, so hopefully it's still nice and strong. But yeah, I think this is probably the trickiest bit of this done. Oh, the zip though. Gotta put in a zip. But I have got one in the right colour this time at least, and the right size, which makes a change for me. Once cut and pinned together, I carefully tacked the side seams in place, making sure the stripes matched up exactly on each side. I measured and marked the placement for the zip so that I would know not to sew that bit shut. I then very slowly and carefully machined precisely along my tacking line. When I got to the opening for the zip, I changed to a basting stitch. Or at least, I thought I did, but I ended up just moving the machine needle. I still haven't been able to get my banana serviced and haven't quite gotten used to this brother machine yet. I basted the zip opening closed, ready to install the zipper later. Then I began carefully removing the tacking I had just machined over. This was tricky, but it was worth it to make sure the stripes matched exactly. I then pressed those seams open. Okay, so I have uh, stitched up and pressed my seams in my skirt. As you can see, I spent a very long time making sure to match the stripes correctly. In terms of seam finish, on the original skirt, I overlocked the raw edges and I did contemplate doing that on this. However, I don't have enough of the right colour thread, so I would have to either do it in white or black or green. And I did it in white on the, on the original, but I don't like the way that that looks. So in the, I've actually just uh, left the salvages. So I've used the salvages as the seams that I can just leave the edges. I mean, it's not a very nice selvage because it's so fluffy. I might go in and trim it, but to be honest, I don't think I have the patience for that. So I think I'm just going to leave it. You know, there are probably better ways to do it. I suppose I could have done a French seam, but I want to try and make it as much like the original as possible. And in the original, I really struggled with doing that lapped zip. And I don't think I've actually done one since I made that orange skirt behind me. Uh, so... I think it's time to tackle that. I've prepped the opening, it's tacked shut, and I've marked where the zip has got to go. But amazingly, I had a zip in the right shade and length. Uh, it is unfortunately one of these polyester coil zips, which I genu generally don't like to use, but you've got to work with what you got sometimes. So because I haven't done a lap zip ever successfully, it's time to get out my favourite Go to sewing book. This is absolutely, it's one of the only sewing books I really recommend. This is the only book you'll ever need. It teaches you everything, um, including how to scale up gridded patterns, which is very useful for costume making. My edition is from the 70s. Let's have a look when it was first published. I think it's, yeah, 78, 1978. Oh, it's a first edition. Hmm, that's exciting. Uh, but I do believe that this book is still in print. It was one of the very few set texts I had at university. The other one was Nora War's Corset and Crinolines. Um, so I do really recommend this book. It's got instructions for how to do a lap zip, so I think I'm going to use these instructions. I did look at a few tutorials online, but there was never like a consistent way of doing it that I found across tutorials. So I'm going to trust the Reader's Digest because they usually work for me. The other brilliant thing about this book is it's got some really hilarious sort of 70s sewing patterns in the back. I mean, frankly, look at that. Oh, oh, lovely. But my absolute favourite has got to be Derek the Dinosaur. Look at that. I mean, who... Who doesn't need a giant cuddly dinosaur in their life? Anyway, I'm procrastinating. Time to crack on with this zip. The Reader's Digest instructions said to pin and baste one half of the zip in place, 
centering the zip teeth over the tacked shut seam. Then it said to flip the zip over so that the right side was facing up to reveal the seam allowance and to machine through all thicknesses as close to the zip teeth as possible. It optimistically said pin if required. There was no way I was accurately going to be able to machine down this tiny width of visible seam allowance without pins. And in fact, I went a step further and tacked it because I was not feeling confident about this turning out right. I switched to a zipper foot and began carefully sewing along that line I had just tacked. This was really counterintuitive. You are essentially top stitching the zip in place, but from the wrong side. It was very confusing and I didn't realize it would be visible at the time and my stitches ended up a bit wonky. So I just went over them instead of unpicking them, which meant I then had two visible lines of stitching. <sighs> oh well, this can't be seen when the zip is closed. Then working from the right side, Reader's Digest said to smooth the right side of the fabric to be as flat as possible and pin it in place. Then to tack a guideline for the top stitching 12 to 15 millimeters from that seam. I measured this out with a friction pen for precision before tacking the zip in place. In the end, I didn't top stitch it in place, but did a prick stitch instead because I thought that the stitching line would disrupt the lines of the stripes. I also then was able to change colour thread as the stripes changed to make them even more invisible. However, I was worried about the prick stitching not being very strong, so I ended up going in and machine stitching the zip to the seam allowance for extra reinforcement. I then gave the zip a good press before removing the tacking that held the zip closed. I undid the zip to check everything worked and did my best to press out some of the scarring that had occurred from the machine tacking. A spritz with water helped. I then began construction on the waistband. This I cut from an orange strip of the fabric, mostly because it was the only one wide enough to have just one colour on the waistband, but also because I liked the idea of having a horizontal orange stripe running perpendicular to the vertical orange stripe I had managed to get at the centre front and back of the skirt. I pressed the waistband in half and then pinned a length of waistband petersham up against the fold. I decided to use waistband petersham for strength, seeing as this satin was so slippery. I tacked the petersham in place with long diagonal basting stitches as I knew trying to sew the slippery satin to the rigid petersham was going to be fiddly. Then I machined the petersham in place down each side following the stripes as a guide to keep my stitching straight. With right sides together, I stitched the short ends of the waistband shut. It was at this point I realised I was going to be playing thread chicken. Again! Then I trimmed the corners of the seam allowance so that I could turn the corners of the waistband through neatly. Now that I had machined that petersham in place, I could remove the tacking. Then everything got a good press. The satin was pretty bouncy, so it didn't give as crisp an edge as I would like, but I did manage to get the seam line to roll around to the wrong side quite nicely. I carefully pinned and tacked the waistband to the skirt. Easing in the circular waistline of the skirt to the straight waistband was challenging, and I needed to have the petersham on the inside of the body so I ended up having to do the hand finishing on the right side, but I was okay with that as I knew my hand stitching is pretty neat. Once tacked on, I ran the seam through the machine, carefully smoothing and adjust the fabric to avoid puckers. Then I removed the tacking and I double checked to make sure my waistband matched up over the zip. I've been caught out like this one too many times before, so I always double check before I begin with hand sewing the waistband in place. I clipped into the seam allowance of the skirt so that the curve would open up and lay flat, and then slip stitched the turned under edge of the waistband in place, starting with the underlap. 
Doing this from the right side meant I really took my time to keep my stitches as even and invisible as possible. In the end it was hardly noticeable, so I'm glad I took my time with it. Next came the fastenings. I used a standard skirt or trouser, hook and bar for the place where the waistband met the edge of the zip, but for the underlap section I just used a popper. The hook and bar will take all the tension of the closure, whereas the popper is just there to stop the underlap flapping about. I actually put my uh, garland up, which is nice. I know I don't have this uh, ugly drain pipe in every shot. Well, I mean, it is in every shot I've just uh, covered it up so it looks a bit nice, neater now. For the circle skirt hem I left overnight and it grew a lot so I feel it's got some more growing to do probably. I should explain what I'm talking about. So when you cut fabrics on the bias which is the 45 degree uh, diagonal angle due to the way that the fabric is woven that is much stretchier than it is when it's straight. So if you cut something in a circle or if you cut a skirt for example that's got some diagonal seams and some straight seams um, over time, the weight of the fabric stretches out the diagonal seam and not the straight seam, and so you get an uneven hem. So if you're making something uh, which is either cut in a circle, like a circle skirt, or has got these biased diagonal seams in, it's really important to let sort of the weight of the fabric settle so that you can, and then even up the hem, and then it shouldn't grow as you wear it because there's nothing worse than beautifully hand finishing a hem and then by the end of the day or the first day of wearing it your skirt hem looks like this because the diagonal seams have stretched more than the centre front and centre back. Uh, so with the nature of that very slippery uh, silk satin, well visco silk satin, it's surprisingly heavy and so on the bias it's growing a lot, it's stretching out a lot. So I left it to stretch out under the weight of itself overnight but I think I'm going to leave it for another maybe day or so and I've put little plastic clips around the bottom of the hem and that should hopefully speed up any drop that's going to happen and it will hopefully mean that things stretch out evenly. So I haven't decided how I'm actually going to hem this yet. My hope is to do bias binding because that is in my opinion the best way to finish a circle skirt. However, with the nature of these stripes, I have got a very little bit of this fabric left. I might see, I think by my calculations, I need like five and a half meters of bias binding <laughs> to hem this circle skirt. I don't know if I'm gonna have enough, but I'm gonna play around and see. If not, I'll have to do uh, probably a hand rolled hem, I think will be best because I want this to, skirt to be as long as possible. So I think I'm going to try and get as much bias binding as possible out of this scrap of fabric. Uh, it's not usable for anything else really, so if I cut it up and it turns out I don't have enough, it won't be the end of the world. I'll have some nice satiny stripy bias binding to use for something at some point. But yeah, it's nearly done. Because I was using stash thread for this project, I am of course playing thread chicken again. Uh, it should be just about alright. <sighs> but uh... I'm a little bit nervous about it. I have got some other orange or red threads I could use. Just gotta see how it goes, I guess. And then this is the point in the video where all the quilters in the audience laugh at my ineptitude with a rotary cutter. I measured and cut bias strips of the satin awkwardly like this before I realized it was easier to turn the fabric over and roll the rotary cutter away from me. Then I joined all those bias strips together to make one continuous length of bias. I stitched the joins together in a chain to save on thread as I was drastically running out of thread at this point. All those seams were pressed open and trimmed to reduce the bulk and then I began what is easily my least favourite sewing task, levelling the hem. I usually put the stand on the table for this, but due to the low garage ceiling, the stand was too tall to do this, which meant I had to do it on the floor. As you can see in this clip, I am modelling my very fetching beige compression socks and had to psych myself up with a cup of tea. But then I got on with it. I took off all the little clips that I'd used to weight the hem. Bulldog clips or clothes pegs work just as well if you don't have these little quilters clips. Once I was in position like this, I realised I had forgotten to go and borrow my dad's metre stick, so I used what I had on hand instead, which was my walking stick. <laughs>
I just put a bit of tape on the stick where the skirt was the shortest and then leaned it up against the skirt and marked with a pin where the bit of tape came to on the hem of the skirt. I really need to buy a skirt hemmer. Please someone remind me in the comments to just buy a skirt hemmer. It would make this process so much easier. I worked my way around the hem, pinning at the tape mark, and then I got my shears and cut the excess off just below the pin. For this, I had to abandon my little stool and sit on the floor because I couldn't get the right angle for cutting. You can see here just how much the skirt grew on the bias, probably a good 10 centimeters or four inches. I then spent some time looking at the hem to double check everything was even and level and if there were any wobbly bits I just trimmed them up so things were nice and smooth. Then I took the skirt off the stand and began clipping the bias strip in place ready to sew it to the hem of the skirt with the right sides together. I then machined this in place, trying my hardest not to stretch out the wibbly wobbly bias curves of both the skirt and the bias tape. While of course desperately hoping that I wouldn't run out of thread. <sighs> I of course ran out of thread. I had to switch to this much brighter orange, which was a shame, but as you don't see it on the finished hem, it wasn't a huge deal. I carried on sewing the hem before filming some excellent footage of my elbow trimming the curved hem allowance with pinking shears to help the curve turn around to the other side. I pressed the bias first down away from the skirt and then around to the inside and turned the top edge under so that the finished bias strip was three centimeters wide. I then carefully slip stitched the hem in place. Like before when I had been prick stitching the zip, I changed thread colours to coordinate with the stripes and wherever possible I tried to avoid having red thread on a beige stripe or vice versa. This meant lots of changing of thread and needle, but I think it was worth it. With the hem stitched in place, all it needed was a final press and the skirt was complete. Here's a little reminder of the outfit before. You can see the clingy, static nature of the skirt satin and the way the blouse is just too wide across the shoulders. Then, with a little bit of TikTok style magic, this is the finished remake. I am so pleased with how the skirt came out. It has such a beautiful body and drape and just looks so much more sophisticated than that tacky polka dot Halloween costume. This is possibly the best pattern matching I have ever done and that lapped zip, which defeated me as a 16 year old, turned out pretty well. It does gape a touch at the top when the zip is closed because of the bulk of the zipper pull but I'm okay with that. The waistband is a, a bit tight, but it certainly gives that 50s cinched waist. I'm so glad I chose to go with a bias binding for the hem. I love the glimpse you get of the stripes on the inside, but even though I spent a long time carefully leveling and hand stitching it, the hem still isn't perfect. But this skirt has an amazing swoosh to it. I tried to do some dramatic turns to show it off, but I had mixed results. All right, so that is it for this project. It's all finished. I've put everything on. I've got the blouse on, I've got the skirt on to do a little photo shoot. But I thought I'd also do a little sort of postscript to this project because this has actually been a really great exercise for my self-esteem <laughs> because uh, I don't really consider myself to be quite a self-confident and self-assured person. However, particularly with my sewing, I definitely have days where I'm like, I'm the biggest fraud in the world. I'm terrible at this. I should never sew ever again. I'm the worst, you know, all those sorts of things. And actually going back to exactly the same sewing pattern, exactly the same sort of design concept, that I had at the very beginning of my sewing journey and remaking it now has really made me realize that I'm actually pretty good at sewing and I really enjoy it more importantly. And I might not be the best designer in the world still. I don't think that will ever be a part of my skill set that I ever feel particularly confident in, but I'm at least better than I was. So that's nice. One of the interesting things about sort of perfectionism and sewing for me is that as a disabled person, I have had to let go of so much of my perfectionism 
because I physically cannot do it. And that's been a really tough learning journey for me. And it feels nice to kind of ha have arrived at a point now with this project where I really don't care. I guess I've kind of just made my peace with it. Uh, and I've come to accept that uh, the standard that I know and believe to be acceptable isn't the standard I can realistically achieve all of the time. That doesn't mean I still can't achieve it if I wanted to, uh, it's just not worth it for me. So it turns out this, this project's been full of personal growth, I suppose. I've t I'm taking away so many wonderful sort of positive things from making this project, as well as two really cute garments that I'm probably going to get quite a lot of wear out of. What more can you ask for in a sewing project, really? So I think that's enough waffling on for now. So all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching. See you next time. I don't know if anybody actually noticed this, but I actually swapped out one of my Singing in the Rain posters for a West Side Story one. So it's me and the Jets. Huh. <laughs>